Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome once again to our Research Report webcast series. My name is Eric Cavanaugh. I will be your moderator for today's concluding webcast, at least for this major section of our research, on database technology. One size doesn't fit all the new database revolution. Folks, we've been focusing on this for months now. We've done many in-depth interviews. We've reviewed literally hundreds of pages of notes, written probably a dozen or more articles. This is the fourth webcast in our series. You can find all the stuff I'm talking about at databaserevolution.com that will remain the marshalling area for our research into database technologies. So let's move right along. Here's a slide about yours truly and enough about me. Our analysts are Robin Bloor and Mark Madsen. Of course, Robin is chief analyst here at the Bloor Group. Mark Madsen is the proprietor of Third Nature, a renowned presenter and thinker in the field of database and analytics, and also integration and other things. He focuses a lot on new technologies. And boy, is there a lot of new stuff going on in the field of database. It's just amazing. I've really been surprised since we began this journey at just how much interesting stuff is happening, and it seems like we're learning about a new company almost every day. And you will learn about that kind of stuff if you look into database these days because it's just off the charts. No SQL, new SQL, different kinds of database technologies. It's not just IBM and Oracle and and uh, Microsoft anymore. And of course, uh, SAP has gotten into the database market. In fact, in their conference call about two or three weeks ago, they said quite boldly, we are a database company now. They've got, of course, Sybase IQ and Sybase uh, ASC, and they also have HANA, which we've been hearing a lot about. We'll probably dig into HANA sometime later this year to really understand what's going on there, but I tell you, these guys have a lot of slides and a lot of material, so I'm not going to talk but for another minute, but I did want to say a couple quick things. One, Please do send your questions in. The best way to get custom value from these things is to send in questions. We'll have an extensive Q&A. We will probably go over 60 minutes for almost all the webcasts we do these days. They wind up being about 70 minutes or so. But you can tweet with the hashtag of DBREV to find out uh, or to get your questions in to us during the live event. And I just wanted to say one of the things I think that has changed the most in the last year or so with respect to database technology is awareness. In our survey, we asked people if they're doing a proof of concept right now, and we got a lot of answers that said yes. And there were, must have been 30 or 40 different database technologies that are being tested right now. I'm sure many of you know about some of these open source movements that are leading to products like uh, TenGen and DataStax and some of these others using open source technologies underneath and then building a proprietary product on top of that, a very hot topic. Dr. Michael Stonebreaker, arguably the godfather of database technology, was on DM Radio earlier this year, and he made one of the most uh, remarkable comments I've heard about database. It was kind of a, uh, a slight on database salespeople of old, and he commented that this whole wave of open source movements is going to essentially eradicate the database salesperson whose only skill is taking you out to lunch. So interesting stuff going on there. I'm going to go ahead and give Robin Bloor the keys to the WebEx car here. And Robin, you can just go ahead and click anywhere on that slide and use your down arrow to start going through the slides. And by the way, I see the sponsor slide is coming up. We have an additional sponsor of Dataversity who came in as a media sponsor near late in the game here. So big thanks to them as well. But with that, I'm going to hand it over to Robin Bloor. The floor is yours. Okay. <clears throat> Um, well, basically what we're going to do here, um, there's kind of three parts to this presentation. I'm going to kick off and I'm just going to make a whole series of points, which are things that I think need to be emphasized in the area of databases. Then I'm going to pass the baton to Mark, who's going to... He's going to look at performance in a lot of different ways, basically, because we think, by and large, that really the center of gravity of all this is performance. <coughs> and then finally, we'll get together at the end and just discuss how to select a database. So, these slides are moving, are they, Eric? Yes, they are, yep. Go for yeah. it. Okay, so first part, market changes, database changes. 
Well, the market's changing and the databases are changing accordingly. It's not that the older um, and even very popular products have gone away. It's just that a number of new products have come forward. Um, in the first of the presentations we did in this series, um, I kind of emphasize the performance bottlenecks. Fundamentally, a database is trying to, in one way or another, from a performance perspective, <coughs> is trying to marshal all the resources available to it. And um, in doing so, it, it actually has to, in one way or another, balance those resources so that you don't get CPU saturation, you don't get memory saturation, you don't get disk I.O. channel saturation, you don't get conflicts because of locking that cause delays. Those were the four major bottlenecks that used to exist in database when database lived in SMP environments or even on mainframes. The two things that we can add to this is that um, now that we're in a very scale-out world, net network saturation can possibly be a bottleneck. And um, parallelism can lead to a bottleneck if you have an inefficient load balancing amongst the various parallel resources you have available to you. So the game in terms of performance has changed, but it's, it, it's the old performance bottlenecks didn't go away. We just got a couple of new areas where we need to be concerned about performance. Uh, and that's enough about performance. Mark will go into it in depth later. <coughs> This is um, a diagram of um, multiple database roles. This is the kind of thing that you would have seen around, you know, the year 2000, um, where you know you have an um, you 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 have the transactional systems. Some of them are on unstructured data. Some of them are on structured data. Um, the unstructured data may go to some kind of content database, a document store, or may just state to be a file or some specialist object. Um, DMS, and quite possibly there'll be BI, BI applications running against that, but most of the action is actually happening with structured data. And you can see that there was already, if you like, a, a chain of databases from the um, applications databases. Data often sent to a staging area before it's um, pulled into a data warehouse, perhaps for data cleansing or other such activity, or simply because the data warehouse needs data to be staged before it can ingest it. <coughs> There's also the emergence of the operational data store for the data that didn't actually get to the data warehouse fast enough for some kind of BI apps. The data warehouse itself, um, you would get people um, pulling off data marts, pulling off even personal data stores, <coughs> and of course pulling off OLAP cubes. And those were the database roles, and now, um, well now there are more. And um, that's part of what's happened. So uh, let's look at this in terms of big data. We hear, uh, we hear the term big data all the time. I'm not sure that anyone has ever attempted to define it, but basically it's more data than you had before, or possibly it's data that causes some kind of performance issue with the technology you've got. What we have here is um, my attempt to just illustrate the kind of global um, expansion of the universe of data that um, has happened within the corporation. We used to pull information from corporate databases. That expanded to, un uh, to include unstructured data in the BI space. It was necessary to have personal departmental data, which might be on, you know, Microsoft <coughs> Access databases or even in spreadsheets. Uh, beyond that, supply chain data up and down the supply line, of course, as much just customer data as possible for a lot of companies that are very customer focused. Then we had the advent of the web <coughs> and um, various data from various websites including, if you like, market data, including, if you like, um, <coughs> competitor data and so on and so forth, uh, but also, of course, the corporate website and um, the processing of that data. Then we had the additional social networks. Um, social network being the conversation between people who might well be your customers or at least might be influencers of your customers. Um, and you didn't have access to their data before, and now you can, through Facebook, Twitter, etc., have some kind of access to that data, examine it, and so on and so forth. And then we've got embedded systems data. And if you kind of think about it, 
all of these, let's say, different layers of data are actually expanding, growing in various ways, growing in terms of the volume. <coughs> and therefore, any organization which is actually interested in the whole set of these things also is looking at big volume. And a lot of this data, especially you know, data from outside embedded systems, data social network data, or even log data from the web, is just too big to envisage ever dropping into the data warehouse. So you, you tend to have this, well, we'll, throw, we'll assemble a heap of it and then we'll throw some queries out and we'll extract what we think is useful and maybe we'll put that in the data warehouse or maybe we'll analyze that directly. So if you like, the situation that we kind of looked at before, there were a lot of different roles of database. Well, now there's yet another role of database, which I kind of think of as a kind of um, ETL, but ETL to the universe of data rather than ETL in respect of your corporate applications. Um, and of course, there can be many, many um, BI applications that glom onto that, start to use it. So it creates a lot more potential uses for BI tools, or even the emergence of new BI tools. <coughs> um, this is Mark's comment. I'm, I borrowed some of Mark's slides. Um, it's just what I thought was a fairly um, astute comment. Unstructured data isn't really unstructured. Of course it isn't unstructured. If it was unstructured, we wouldn't be able to access it with programs. Um, it, it has its structure. Some programs will know the structure. The problem is that this data isn't declared and available for everybody to get at in a standardized way. And it's almost certainly unmodeled because its, um, its structure has been organized possibly for a single application or a small group of applications. Uh, so the real challenge often with big data, especially as a lot of um, big data happens to be in structured data, it's actually the complexity of a data structure and the fact that, if you like, there's been no analysis done on that. Um, to kind of model it and make it freely available to multiple applications. I'd also um, add this, that, Rob. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, one additional comment is just that uh, with a lot of those kinds of things, uh, we we have structure which is not in a database, you know, it, 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 it's, it's called unstructured because it's stored in a way that isn't self-referentially describing, and so it's locked into code somewhere. Yes, it's buried in the code. And actually may be very difficult to get at in terms of the code as well, because source code isn't freely available. Okay, this, this next, cli uh, next slide is just Basically, this is just a very, very general outline as to what happens with big data in a very rough way. This was this was originally drawn just to illustrate the way that column store databases work, but in actual fact, when you look at the scale-out databases, they're all fairly similar in the way that they work. I mean, there's lots and lots of differences, and there's lots and lots of subtle differences. But it, it fundamentally is this. If you look at the query at the top, the query will get divided up so that it can go to multiple resources. So it effectively has been divided into sub-queries, and each sub-query is run against the multiple resources. Each of those resources, or if you like, server nodes in the network, uh, may have multiple CPUs, almost certainly will have multiple disks. And um, there will be parallelization across the disk. Um, data very likely is going to be compressed. Uh, and each individual node, <coughs> if you like, has um, uh, a, uh, a subset of all the data. If you get more sophisticated than that in the sense that, well, it wants to be completely fail-safe, then maybe the data exists twice in this kind of network. Um, how you actually communicate between the nodes, there are various ways of actually allocating data to nodes and having the query, there's going to have to be one server at least that masters the query, but likely there will be an ability for many of the servers in case one of them fails to master the query so that if a server fails, the query will still continue in, in one way or another because you'll have to double source of data and double source of the state of any individual query. Um, and if you look at all of the, the what I would call big data products, they pretty much all have this kind of scale-out data structure. They, 
they, uh, sorry, scale out architecture. They they differ in various ways, and some of them very done very innovative things. But that's the kind of fundamental arrangement of it all. Um, no sequel. Um, we'd advocate that we stop using the term no sequel. And it was like after I kind of drew this graph. It's a very simple graph. We classified all of the all of the um, existing traditional relational databases are old SQL, and the only real distinction between old SQL and new SQL is that the new SQL scales out to higher data volumes. Um, uh, and it kind of covers the same sort of area, single table, star, star schema, snowflake, TNF schema, even OLAP. It all vary according to product as what it's actually capable of. But that's kind of a fairly solid thing. But if you actually look at what NoSQL covers, it, it, it turns out that NoSQL is just a bucket term, that any database that in one way or another either goes beyond SQL or doesn't fully implement SQL um, calls itself NoSQL. And so you may get um, databases that are entirely based on on Bigtable, Google's Bigtable idea. And, and they're just right at the top there. They're, they're single databases, and they, and they don't implement SQL fully simply because they don't do joins. So they, they do select and project, and they may actually be, you know, doing the workload that they're serving better than anything else can. But they really don't travel below that. And then you've got, you know, complex data. You've got some uh, XML databases that are fundamentally no SQL. You've got some rather uh, graph databases. You've got the various nested data that relational doesn't handle very well. Um, um, all in a category that we would have to describe as NoSQL. But even describing it as NoSQL, of course, some of these products may have SQL capabilities. So they're not, they've, they are e effectively not only SQL. Um, so in reality, again, this is one of Mark's slides, so if you want to barge in, Mark, I'm quite happy for you to do that. But um, in reality, what we're looking at with most of the NoSQL products is data stores that augment or replace relational access and, and storage, models with, uh, storage models with other methods than the normal relational access. So you know, key value stores, hash table stores, a lot of key value stores are based on hash tables. Um, use of column families, object and document stores, graphical data, um, different access models, SQL rarely, because there's normally something else, and the SQL implementation is probably just ODBC and JBDC where it exists, rather than what you would call a, a sophisticated SQL. Um, programming API, and pretty much um, most of what they're doing is get put. Is there anything you wanted to add to that, Mark? Um, not particularly. I mean, that umbrella term covers some pretty broad technologies and that's really the you know the 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 main point and I think we'll try and get into some of that a little bit later. Okay. Um so this is just a list of no sequels directions, but again to emphasize the point that this is just a bucket, you know, some no sequel databases do not attempt to provide all the asset properties. Um uh Particularly eventual consistency rather than immediate consistency is one of the things that some of the products out there do. Some NoSQL databases deploy distributed scalar architecture with data redundancy. XML DBMS using X, X query are by definition NoSQL databases. Some document stores are NoSQL databases. Argu uh, object databases are by definition NoSQL databases. Um, key value um, stores, um, schema schemaless stores, also NoSQL database, graph databases, NoSQL database, and the large pools of data, um, given that they don't implement joins um, based on big table and so on, they're NoSQL databases as well. So it's really um, a, a really diverse set of products. Okay, so what's the problem with SQL? Um, SQL is very good for set manipulation. We wouldn't have been able to do the vast number, and we are talking about maybe even millions of applications, um, using SQL without the fact that it is extraordinarily good at set, uh, set manipulation, and it looks after most of the common 
um, data structures that we will find in building applications. It certainly works for LPT. And uh, many query environments, it, it, it's never had that much of a problem with um, most of the kind of workloads that you get in data warehouses, for example. However, it's not good for nested data structures. You can possibly get at nested data structures with SQL, but it's an awkward way of doing it. It's absolutely not natural. Uh, and anyway, if you had something like a, a, a complete um, bill of materials kind of thing, SQL itself doesn't have recursion, so you could never get to the bottom of the bill of materials without doing some awkward programming. Um, it's not good for ordered data sets because it, uh, SQL has no sense of ordering. And it's not good for data graphs, that's networks of values. In those areas, it's lacking. Um, so, um, good conceptual model, but prematurely standardized implementation is probably what we could say. A relational database is fundamentally the dominant technology for storing and retrieving data. Um, but it's got a static schema, that itself dynamic. Um, the uh, problem of dynamic metadata isn't properly addressed with it. It's got no rich typing system. Uh, as already mentioned, no concept of ordering. Uh, and that creates real problem with time series because pretty much time series data, you want fundamentally the order of time to be fundamental to the way that the data is. Many are not good fits for um, network parallel computing. For example, in the cloud, um, that's partly to do with architecture, so there may be exceptions to that. Um, but anyway, the cloud itself is a little questionable for some kinds of applications. Limited API in atomic SQL statement syntax and simple re um, results set return. You can't really um, process intermediate sets very well in um, SQL, and it's got poor developer support. Um, there's the famous impedance mismatch. This just because fundamentally the OO languages looked at data in an entirely different way to the way, should, way the relational database is looked at data. So in order to make that data persist, there needed to be a mapping between the way that the OO program was looking at the data and the way that the relational database wanted to store that. Um, and luckily there were, and particularly the open source Hibernate came into existence and pretty much solved the situation. However, you have a complete um, divergence between what the programmer views as data and what the database views as data. Um, well, this is one of Mark's amusing slides. <laughs> that's, um, that's some impedance mismatch. Um, this is a kind of an interesting thing, and, and this is now coming to the fore much more than it did before. Basically, SQL has data definition, and it, and it has data manipulation to select, project, and join. But it has no fundamental mathematical manipulation of data and no time-based manipulation of data. And because of that, you end up, if you're actually wanting to do something to the data, there may be two places you want to do it. You may want to do it on an analytical database, in which case you may want to carry out a whole series of calculations before you get the answer returned, or you may actually want it on the desktop, um, in, in which case you may pull the SQL and you want to um, uh, apply the mathematics and the, or the time manipulation afterwards. But either way, SQL has become a barrier because you've, you've effectively forced that process into one side or the other, uh, and SQL stands in the middle and, and creates problems accordingly. And because of that, when you now look at analytical databases, you're seeing you know, the implementation of R and a whole lot of analytical capabilities right down there in the database, which traditionally isn't what was supposed to happen with relational database. You weren't supposed to be forced to put uh, a lot of um, processing in the database, but we have to do this. There are problems that would not be solved of, uh, without that. Um, okay, let's talk about map reviews and Hadoop. Because uh, this is, I, I have to say, this is one of the, um, I would say, dominant trends. It's it's almost um, it's almost impossible to get a particularly strong handle on how popular Hadoop and MapReduce is, but it's certainly extraordinarily popular. 
and <clears throat> is therefore worth um, talking about. And, I mean, the first thing to to point out is that Hadoop is not a database. It's not a database management system. It's actually a file system that has a parallel processing environment stuck on top of it. This is kind of illustrated in the um, in the diagram here, which is showing a kind of um, uh, how MapReduce itself kind of processes things as a mapping process, a reducing process, and a scheduler that divides workloads across many, many, many nodes. And, and there are instances of um, uh, of Hadoop that span more than a thousand nodes. I mean, you know, we are talking really large scale in terms of the number of um, uh, servers that are working together. Um, and the whole idea is to have them all working in parallel and therefore you get a very fast answer for something that would have been a very slow answer. And then since Hadoop became Hadoop and MapReduce, because MapReduce is effectively the algorithm for parallelizing, since they became popular, of course, people have developed things to sit over Hadoop. So you've got HBase that turns Hadoop into a database of a kind, or it gives it kind of database qualities. You have a Hive that adds an SQL paper capability, and you have Pig that adds analytics. So what started as an interesting project in parallelism has turned into a whole ecosystem to which more and more has been added. And if something's been added since the last time I looked, I'll be not at all surprised. So again, this is one of Mark's slides, but using her MapReduce Hadoop, um, there are different variations with different performances and resource characteristics. Um, Hadoop is only part of the solution, but it, it's also worth saying Hadoop isn't necessarily a database thing. Um, Hadoop has been used, for instance, for rendering 3D video. It, it, it can be because it's a parallel environment. If you can get enough resource together and break up uh, a task and have it span the environment, then you can have it go at a lot of things. You can certainly do a lot of scientific computing with it. Um, and um, this, I believe, is this right? Is this Cloud Cloudera's distribution for Hadoop, Mark? Yeah, th this is uh, what you know, Cloudera's view. It's actually a slightly dated Cloudera view because there have been some things added to it. But th they'll all have some similar thing, you know, whether you're talking Hortonworks or or uh, IBM's or, or MapR. Okay. Um, okay, and this is the final slide, and, and this is kind of was our point of departure, but a new set of products has appeared. Uh, and in actual fact, as Eric was re re remarking early on, we seem to get another database company that we didn't know existed that contacting us at least once a week. I mean, there's just more and more database products crawling out, crawling out of the woodwork. Um, they include some fundamental innovations, or if you like, different ways of doing things, or possibly doing things in a way that we haven't done them for 30 years, but actually, you know, old ideas have been revived. Um, a few are already, in our view, sufficiently popular to last. And once a, a product gets traction, the next thing that it does is it starts to add functionality that we might be critical of it not having. Um, so, you know, once you get some products um, uh, gaining traction, then it's difficult not to be viewing what's going on here as a database revolution of a kind. Fashion um, and marketing drive greater adoption once something's got traction, product defects begin to be addressed, and eventually they begin to challenge the dominant product. So the real question I think we ask about the new kids on the block is whether they will become dominant products in time, because they might. Okay, let's talk about performance. Mark, you can take over. Yeah, and I'll go ahead and grab the keys here just for one hot second. And folks, we have a couple of good questions already coming in. Thank you very much for those. So I'm going to go ahead and queue up this slide right here and hand it over to Mark. And Mark, do you know how to use that thumbnails view? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, lower left-hand corner, it's the second icon from the left for a presenter, so you can actually see all the slides that are coming up. Gotcha. Okay. All right, looks good. 
Okay, uh, looks like we are set up and I can advance, okay. So I'm actually going to roll back just a second before rolling into the performance piece, but um, you know, just to sort of summarize a couple of the things that we are looking at, you know, the the, the, the reasons that, that you're doing things, the real market force is these days that have pushed the database market are things you know, like performance, scalability, capability, and cost or complexity. And, um, you know, the, we, we had this idea that the database was a universal, relational, ACID-compliant, fixed schema database. And that served well under a set of market assumptions, but when you push things like extremely low latency and extremely high concurrency or very large data sizes combined with online query, things start to break down a little bit. And so, um, let's see, sorry. Um, you know, so, so we, we've gotten past this. Uh, Robin showed this before, so I won't reiterate the whole thing, but, but there are some some important aspects here which have led to these post-relational or going back to pre-relational stores, whether they be key value or hash table or, or you know, so, some interesting things combining aspects of document stores with either XML markup, say, or other things, and then allowing them to be indexed using information retrieval techniques gives you some alternate technologies to go after data that don't have relational characteristics. So you can't always join data in those things without first in sticking in extra indexes that allow things to be related. But for the things which have been indexed, you can go into them. And they, they get past some of these rich typing system problems, particularly with, with free or semi-structured text. And um, you know, relational databases having no concept of ordering. When ordering, for time series analysis is implicit in data that, that can create some real problems. So um, if we look at uh, you know, big data, we talk about that being unstructured, when in fact a lot of it is unmodeled because the model, the, the semantic content, what is this stuff, is stored in a program which has written the data. It's not stored in the database that defines that data or links the semantic information, the tags, the, the notations, whatever, to the data elements to tell you what's there. Which is why we have this problem where text and objects and data don't always fit together. You know, an, an object might have nested structure and links within it. And yes, you can model that into a database, but then to pull that out, you use SQL, but SQL returns to you a single rectangle of data which means that if you have a nested relationship, a parent and children, an order and its lines, you end up with repetition of the parent in the tabular structure. And of course, that's a problem to a program which is dealing with things in its structural form of an object or a nested hierarchy or something like that. And that's a fundamental problem, which has led to all these new choices, which in some ways you could say are old choices because we had document stores and, and hierarchical stores, but they had some things with them as well. They had ACID compliance. They had single schema model as opposed to the possibility of storing multiple structures with the same key. And so those pre-relational things are somewhat different than post-relational. I kind of like um, Nathan Hurst's slide, which delineated uh, NoSQL systems in a very different way, which wasn't looking at what technology they're built, built with, which is how Robin and I look at it, you know, key value store versus uh, an object store, which is in a way a key value store, but somewhat different because KBS or DHT assumes a tabular data structure. He broke it out based on the CAP theorem, based on, you know, consistency, availability, and partition tolerance, uh, pick two. Uh, for those of you who don't know, partition tolerance is when you have a collection of servers and your data and your database are spread across those servers. If you have a network partition, you lose access to some of those. And the way around partitions uh, of a network, basically breaking your database in two if you lose connectivity to some of the nodes, is through things like, like replication, you know, K replication. You put your data in three places, and then hopefully the network partitions in such a way that you still have access to a consistent set of data. But you make trade-offs when you choose these things, and so you have 
you know, along each leg here, you have things which are consistent and available, like parallel databases, say a Teradata or something like that, where if you lose a node, you basically lose your database. Um, unless, of course, you know, we're, we're talking standby, but that's not quite the same thing. Um, so th this is a nice little way of breaking it up, but the interesting aspect here, too, is, is when you look at these stores and you look at what they are, um, and, and the, the data models, they're all uh, kind of lining up along those axes. But one thing it doesn't really take into advantage into account is the type of workloads. You know, what about analytics in these contexts? Uh, there's all these different analytic techniques and technologies. You know, there's in, in the BI market or the analytics market, they sort of used advanced analytics for a period of time, and I think that was too many syllables, so it's now just analytics. But you know, the, the machine learning uh, or data mining, as, as people liked to call it in the data markets, or statistics, rules engines, information theory, which includes all of that free text indexing and search technology and other more esoteric things, and even data visualization. All these things drive different performance characteristics and workloads, and the holy grail for the database market is being able to handle query workloads while simultaneously handling these new data types, this big data and analytics stuff. And interestingly enough, straight relational universal databases and a bunch of these different types of NoSQL stores handle various aspects of it, but computation over data still breaks a lot of them. It breaks NoSQL stores because most of them can't join data. And one of the natures of dealing with data and analyzing it is joining that. So you have to often pre-stage data in a NoSQL database. In a relational database, you can join it all together and get your stuff, but it may not have the rich data typing and data structure storage that you need. And so you end up with possible mismatches. And everybody is working like crazy to figure out how to do this, and they're all doing it in different ways. And, and so what we're really saying is that technologies aren't perfect replacements. Just because you have a Cassandra or a Mark Logic doesn't mean you replace your Oracle or your Teradata. When you, you know, replace the old with the new or try to start over, you're making trade-offs, and usually those trade-offs come back and get you uh, down the road. Um, now, getting into the performance side of things, scalability and performance aren't the same thing. I think that's an important aspect that we need to, to consider because um, a lot of times the vendors conflate these two things. You know, scalability is really the measure of average performance over a load. And you're looking at how, um, you know, how outputs change based on, on, on the change in an input here. And, and so um, what we need to talk about is a little bit more detail. What do we mean by performance? Well, throughput is one of the things. The number of tasks completed in a given time period. So 100 queries or fetches or stores of objects per second. Um, this is really measuring how much work the system can do. You know, it's a single metric that gives you, you know, something like transactions per minute or data loaded per hour if you're just doing a straight ingest load. And it's actually pretty easy to increase throughput without improving response time. So you can throw more queries at a system, but each query still takes about the same amount of time. Because speeding up a query or speeding up a, a write is different than doing more of that thing. And so, you know, that's where we get to response time, the speed, the performance of a single task. You might have 100 queries. Well, what's the response time? One of the things is uh, y you don't specify response times in, in averages, right? Response time is not the time interval divided by the throughput. If you did 100 queries every 10 seconds, well, could be that you did 100 queries and they all took 10 seconds to complete. Or it could be that each of those had a slightly different performance profile, so you finished 100 of them, but the response time varied between one second for the fastest one and 10 seconds for the slowest one. A lot of um, people, when doing RFPs, make the mistake of specifying average response times when what you really need is to understand which specific classes of query or transaction you're dealing with, how many of each of that class you have per time unit, say second, 
and you also need to know, um, you know, 95% will complete within that period. You know, that's how you specify this. What you're really looking at with response time is an individual's experience using a system. You know, how long did it take for that thing? Now, scalability is different from throughput response time. Scalability is scaling up an axis. So you have consistent throughput and response time. Now you double the data, triple the data, double the concurrent users or triple them. It's consistent performance over a, over a particular scale factor, of which there are three. There are three scale factors. Data volume is one. Um, one of the problems with data volume is, is how you measure it. You know, if you look at TPC benchmarks, they're measuring transaction counts. Um, a lot of database vendors measure data volume and things like, like row counts. Or, or just raw data volume. But there's a big difference between a 100-byte record and a 1K record when you look at row counts or you look at data sizings. Um, compression characteristics of, say, a columnar database can affect whether the raw or loaded data, you know, which one is more important when you're looking at the data volume because the compressed data volume gives you maybe a 10x I.O. efficiency. Um, or simply the number of tables in the database and the number of joins. And so what's interesting about this is that you can have a 40 gigabyte database and have serious performance problems because of certain aspects of, of data volume. Um, concurrency is another interesting one. When we're looking at concurrency, uh, it depends on you know whether we're talking OLTP workloads or, or BI workloads or analytics workloads, but um, it's Typically, the number of people, but number of people is not exactly right because number of people is really gated or, or you know, by, by your audience, internal versus external, and then the tools you're using. A dashboard must simultaneously issue 12 different queries to the database, some of which sum up lots of data. Um, and, and so what you're really looking at is, is the number of queries, or in the case of OLTP, the, the combination of the number of queries and the number of, of writes. And then there's this active versus passive thing. Um, in RFPs, a lot of times people don't figure out active versus passive or, or you know, when doing POCs. And the, and the reality is that, um, say, in the BI world, you can usually look at your named user count, so you've got 500 named users. Well, the reality is that concurrency, that is concurrent actives, is probably on the order of 20% of that. And in fact, that's the rule of thumb a lot of BI vendors look at when sizing the, the uh, server that is talking to the database. Um, typically, there aren't you know 500 people simultaneously hitting enter at the same time. Maybe 20% of those people are hitting enter at the same time. and so you have to look at concurrent active versus concurrent passive, and then you need to look at concurrent actives and how many queries or transactions each of those people uh, people look at. So concurrency and queuing theory is really arrival rate multiplied by response time. That's the way you kind of figure out and, and have a solid definition of concurrency. And that's a restatement of something called Little's Law, which uh, Wikipedia is your friend. It's, it's a useful thing to, to kind of look up. So if we look at um, at scalability relationships, at how um, concurrency increases over response time, um, there are workload management tools. Databases, uh, some of them are very sophisticated and have very well evolved workload management tools that can allow you to set groups of users, specific queries, queries against particular tables, queries coming from a particular application to be preferentially treated or, or pushed down in priority so that the things which are important get done. Now this is vital when you have service level agreements to say a call center or a customer um, portal that has say 100,000 people accessing it at one time. You want to make sure that those things come back and page refreshes within say one second. Um, and, and so you have these, these kinds of SLAs. Well, the problem is that workload management gets you so far. Now we're talking about other aspects of scalability. How do you add resources to that? You know, the old database models, well, you throw more boards in a computer. Well, that's not going to really help. 
So what we've got then is a real challenge with um, with the bottlenecking of the system, and that's where these NoSQL cloud-based kinds of things come in. And those things are, um, I'd say, very um, very different in performance characteristics. So you know, when we talk about cloud architectures and dynamic, you know, elastic resource configuration, you can simply float resource, which is very different from sizing a box to its maximum size, which is what you did with a typical relational database or single system database. And then when you look at what happens as you hit a bottleneck, performance doesn't level off, throughput doesn't level off, it typically declines and gets worse because you're actually breaking the system at this point. You've hit the limits of that particular technology. Uh, computational complexity, that's simply you know, the algorithmic complexity of what you're doing over the data. Most business intelligence workloads, most transaction processing workloads have very simple computational uh, requirements. They're doing sums, additions, subtractions, multiplications. They're not looping five times over the data in a, in a clustering model, running floating point calculations, you know, hundreds of floating point calculations per pair of rows in the data set. And so you have these things like, you know, order n squared or order n cubed algorithms that as you throw more data at them very quickly degrade, which is why people can have problems with relatively speaking, small databases because this puts a lot of extra load on the server and causes enormous amounts of I.O. and computation. And, and so we're really saying that you know, performance over size isn't the same as performance over complexity. And when you marry the two, which is a lot of analytics, you have a real um, kind of problem. So um, size in terms of data size, size in terms of the complexity and number of calculations, and size in terms of concurrent access are the three axes that define uh, where a workload sits. And you need to figure out kind of where you are in all three of these and then test that when you're evaluating software. Um, if we look at the, the general workloads, Typically, people define them as OLTP, BI or data warehousing and analytics. And these are a fine abstraction uh, as far as it goes. But um, when you look at them, what do you assume with OLTP? Well, it's, it's mostly writes. Well, really, OLTP is about 70 to 80% reads and about 20 to 30% writes. Um, and, and yes, that varies based on application. but Look at your typical um, order entry screen and look at how many reads are done for that screen versus writes are done for that screen. Um, BI was also assumed to be read only, but it's not really. It's two workloads, the query side, the reporting, dashboarding, whatever side of things, and the data ingest side, the, the extract, transform, load side, which can be batch or could be real time. And you know the, the real the, the, the thing is that that's actually two workloads when you really characterize it. They just happen to run at different times on the same system. And of course, it's very tricky to do two different things with two different sets of performance and workload characteristics on the same system, which is why we end up with database servers that are sized for one side or the other, whichever is beating the crap out of the system the most. And then analytics sort of fall in between depending on you know what they are. Are they very batchy? Uh, kind of big run a model once things, or are they real time? In which case, you've executed the model on huge, num huge numbers of rows of data and massive data sets, have a trained algorithm which is then put in place in real time, like a recommendation engine on a website, and sifting through data very quickly. And so you you typically have you know the, these sort of different high level characteristics, but those things are abstractions. Um, the real workload is down below this. Is, is your workload write biased, read biased, or, or sort of a, an equal mixture of the two? And when you break down these write biased workloads, there's sort of standard OLTP that is online. There's batch processing. There is very lightweight stuff. You know, look at a website. It's 99% read and 1% write for most people's websites. And so that's almost like OLTP Lite, which shares a lot more real-time query performance characteristics. And so uh, you, know, you have these different workloads, and your technology choices will depend on 
your three axes, and what are you optimizing for? Throughput, response time, or both? And what's your scale factor? Do you see rapidly growing user counts, uh, rapid and unpredictable spikes in use? Um, these things would cause you to gravitate towards different technologies. You know, unpredictable spikes in use mean you want something that's elastic, which means you want something that runs well in a cloud, which means you want a, an elastic database or you want a NoSQL store that can fluctuate quickly in that environment and adjust to those unpredictable workloads. Um, important workload parameters to know, you know, read versus write intensive because that will steer you uh, one direction or another. Updatable data. A lot of big data problems today are actually dealing with a, a set kind of like BI of split workloads. One is massive volumes of data streaming in, interaction data, log data, call detail records, it could be anything, but they're never updated. They happen and then they are there. You might process them further to do things to them or process them further to make them more queryable, but your primary workload is write only. And then your secondary workload downstream from that is the reading and analysis of that thing. And if your data is updatable, then you run into some interesting challenges because, for example, NoSQL stores mostly don't handle updates very well. Uh, or they handle updates just fine, but if you have an ACID compliance thing, which is another uh, you know, aspect, are you looking at immediate or eventual consistency? If you change a bank account balance or you change, say, somebody's stock market portfolio at the point where they've executed a trade, um, you don't want inconsistent data showing. You want consistent, up-to-date data because otherwise you can cause all sorts of weird problems. And so you need to know whether or not eventual consistency is okay. And interestingly enough, if you have immutable data, typically eventual consistency is okay, leading you down one path, whereas if you have updatable data, very often that's coupled with OLTP workloads, which have immediate uh, consistency, which is more of an ACID-compliant relational model than, say, a, a NoSQL model or a tunable NoSQL model. Uh, I should say tunable consistency model. Uh, short versus long access latencies, you know, how long do you have before data coming into the system must be presented, which could be instantaneous in the case of a bank account balance, or it's okay if it's five minutes off in the case of some consumer-oriented website. And key to a lot of decisions, I would say one of the key forking requirements on whether you go down a relational path, a parallel database path, a, a NoSQL path, is data access patterns. If you're executing the same queries, the same fetches, the same writes over and over and over again, you can tune those things pretty easily. Whereas if it's very ad hoc, if data is joined in various forms and formats and you're not sure and it changes over time, those unpredictable data access patterns create the need for more flexible query structures, which is where relational forte is. And so that sends you down a very different path. And lastly, data types simple uh, tabular data versus things which are nested, hierarchical, networky, or more to the point, have ordering implicit in them. If you have sets of time series, and each set of time series, like click paths in sessions through a website, and those time series need to be compared, you have difficulty with that relational, which is where you get into some of these hybrid models. And finally, mix. Nothing is simple anymore. We're blending real-time along with non-real-time BI workloads in the same database. We're blending transactions on a website with recommendation execution, analytic inline execution. And so we have these different things. So how do you choose technologies? Um, the reference for this particular paper is, is here. This is um, looking at some of the detailed characteristics. Selectivity, in this case, we're talking relational, tabular data set. The more columns you query in a table or result of a join, that is the number of referenced attributes, the more it's going to favor certain things. And the more selectivity you have, um, fraction of data, am I pulling all of the data or none of the data, the more it's going to favor technologies. And interestingly, in this set of benchmarks that these people ran, looking at row versus column store relational databases and index row versus indexed column store relational databases, 
um, you, you find that there is a pretty clear delineation of the number of referenced or the percent of referenced attributes versus the selectivity, that is the amount of data that you actually read out of the database from 1% to 100% and, um, you know, going up the other axis. And it is interesting that um, it goes along pretty well with conventional wisdom about where and when columnar databases versus row databases uh, help. So I thought that would be a useful sort of thing as you get down into the nuance of what you're looking at inside that workload. So let's look at two things, query and OLTP workloads really quickly. And we're going to be writing a lot of this up in the research paper, the research report that we'll be publishing uh, in the next couple of days that has this information in it at somewhat more detail. But looking at things like selectivity and retrieval. Selectivity, um, are you pulling up uh, just a little bit of the data or are you pulling, uh, are you accessing a lot of the data? And retrieval, are you pulling back a little data or a lot of data? These are query workloads, your conventional BI things, dashboards, ad hoc query, batch analytics, you know, score my entire customer database or inline analytics, um, real-time credit score or uh, recommendation engine, uh, operational BI. You have these different characteristics of uh, selectivity and retrieval, repetition, that is repeatability of queries and uh, the complexity of those queries. And these um, indicate, you know, different ways they tie back to that previous chart. Read-write workloads, um, online OLTP, which I class a lot of websites as because even though they do a lot of reads, at the end of the day, typically you user-generated content is being recorded, orders are being taken, something is happening versus batch OLTP, which is very similar to batch analytics. Object persistence, uh, which is very much like what a lot of websites need to do. Bulk ingest and real-time ingest are very different. If you're doing real-time ingest, you're often reading while you're writing. Bulk ingest is surprisingly easy. Uh, in relational databases and non-relational, you just slap big slabs of data out there. And um, that's easy. But doing bulk ingest while simultaneously querying data or updating data, that's hard. So um, th these are the kinds of characteristics you have to look at. So when we look at standard databases versus parallel databases, now when I say standard, I mean the universal databases, the SQL servers and DB2s and Oracles of the world, versus parallel, that is shared nothing parallel databases that run across many nodes and can potentially be elastic, versus NoSQL databases, that is key value stores, distributed hash tables, and object stores, um, or, or interesting hybrids of that, like, uh, you know, MarkLogic is a document database, uh, so doc stores, um, versus Hadoop, which is processing framework over a big, basically distributed file system, versus a streaming database. The different kind of uh, workload characteristics um, can be good neutral or bad. And so the problem is that you have an intersection here of multiple things because there is no one thing. So you actually have to look at these workload parameters um, and these technologies based on this at a high level and then down in the, the details of the workload because workloads are always a mix. And then finally, your architecture can constrain your options. If you assume a web app architecture as opposed to, say, a Microsoft shop using Microsoft's uh, developer tools, that will steer you towards compatibilities or incompatibilities with your back-end store and constrain the choices that you can make. If you assume a relational database on the back end, then you can't do certain things at web scale. If you assume a NoSQL store, that's really great, except that by building your website in that way, you can't join data. So you've constrained choices on analysis and query. And so your architecture plays as much of a role in the decision over technologies as anything else. Um, so trying to make things really simple and abstract, if you look at things along a read intensity axis and a write intensity axis, you can kind of separate out workloads. So uh, we look at these read-write axes, and um, as the workloads increase along both of these axes, we, we start to fall out of what you can do in what we termed old SQL, that is universal databases, and fall into the new SQL world of parallel databases and database appliances that are really geared towards query and analytic workloads, 
or if you're more on the read-write axis, um, and by the way, that can be just 10% because some of these appliance databases, if you try to do um, real-time or near real-time writing of new data into those databases while simultaneously supporting query workloads, you break them. So you fall into sort of the NoSQL realm. So that's just a very generic rule of thumb. Uh, here's some other rules of thumb that we have around what kinds of things, you know, high-scale OLTP, ACID compliance, batch analytics, and where things fit. Um, that's an easy enough thing to read. So I'm going to turn it back over to Robin to talk at this point about some database selection and, and take some Q&A. Okay. Well, I don't intend to um, go into any great depth here. In the report, we um, put together a, a collection of, first of all, how to run the project to select um, a database. And, you know, that always begins with a feasibility study or should begin with a feasibility study. So what really I've got here are a list of criteria for the feasibility study. And a lot of these criteria, when you gather them, will start to become criteria for selecting a database product. So really, first question, what are the data management requires and po uh, requ requirements and policies, if any, in respect of data security, data cleansing, data governance, deployments of solution in the cloud, um, if a deployment environment is mandated, what are its technical characteristics and limitations and so on and so forth. And, and this is just putting together a whole series of you're going to need reasons to either look at products or eliminate products um, because there are hundreds of database products out there. Um, next thing, what kind of data will be stored and used? Is it structured or unstructured? Is it likely to be on big table or many tables? Um, what are the data value, uh, volumes expected to be? Um, in other words, what's the expected data ingest rate? What will the data retention archiving policy be? How do, big do we expect the database to grow, estimate a range? Um, what are the applications that will use the database? If we don't know what the applications are, we have no way of modeling exactly what queries are going to, or sorry, exactly what access is going to come out of it. So we want an estimate by number of users and transactions. We also want to roughly classify transactions as OLTP, short query, long query, long query analytics, and so on. Um, what are the expectations in respect of growth of usage per user and growth of the user population? Those are two different things. You get situations, for instance, with BI where because uh, transaction goes faster and the user is iterating, they do more contraction, uh, transactions. And that's different than in, in the user population actually going, more people doing it. Um, what are the expected service levels? This actually, I, th I think Mark pre uh, presented the idea of service levels very well, and the point really is to get this down and get this properly defined. Um, what's the budget for the project, uh, and, and what does that cover? Uh, you can all, with infinite money, you can always find um, uh, a, a product that in some way or other get close to what you want to do. But most people don't have infinite money, so you have to actually be realistic. Um, what's the outline project plan? What are the time scale, uh, time scales, delivery of benefits? When are the costs incurred? What we're actually looking at here is you might, for instance, suggest um, that we have a go with Hadoop and a few of the other various tools with Hadoop to do part of this, but that would mean to a certain extent that we might actually have to do a lot of coding, whereas actually another route might take us through uh, a much less manual set of activities. You know, So really, you know, these are business questions to a certain degree. What are the time scales? When are the delivery of benefits expected? When are the costs actually going to be incurred? Who's going to make up the project team? That's a question simply because the, the vendor that you buy a database from, you're going to be interested in their consultancy probably, or you may have your own external consultants that you want to get involved. What's the policy in respect of external support, possibly including vendor consultancy for the early stages of a project? That matters a lot if you're thinking of doing open source, because open source, you really have to investigate in depth as to what, what is available. Whereas you will probably have a very simple contractual situation with, a, um, let, let's say, a more standard vendor. Finally, what are the business benefits? 
which ones can be quantified financially, which ones can only be guessed at, and are there opportunity costs? In other words, this is feasibility. This is saying, is it actually worth us doing this? Um, here's just a list of databases, and as soon as you look at that list, you realize that actually getting down to a short list of about three or four is a, a bit of a, a, t um, a task. So, um, in terms of product selection, we think these are the Roughly the stages, of course, this can change depending upon your exact context, but in the general sense, preliminary investigation, arrival at short list, um, be sure to set the goals and control the process of the product selection, otherwise vendors will try and control the process and they'll possibly spin you um, away from what, what you thought you were doing. Um, you need to do evaluation by technical analysis and modeling at, you know, a theoretical, how does this product work? What are our workloads? How does the, is there a match between this? Um, you can normally do that if you properly understand your workloads. Um, um, just by having a good technical presentation of the various products you're interested in. Um, I would, if I was dealing with big data and big scalability, I wouldn't go anywhere without a proof of concept. And I would want to, um, in one way or another, um, design the proof of concept myself based upon the the kind of data structure that you use and the kind of transactional activity we expect to go on against the data. Um, if, you know, after a proof of concept you disco discover a product isn't actually going to be useful, don't use it. Try something else. There's negotiation based in all product selection. Um, my advice is to you know, make it completely clear to the, event, uh, the vendor what you intend to do. But uh, at a certain point in time, you only have so much budget, you only have so much time to do stuff, so you may want to be able to negotiate about various um, things relating to that. There's not an awful lot more I could say about this. We used to do like three or four hour sessions on product selection. But in order to say much more, you actually have to add context. And this is just a general set of links. Anyway, I think way we're well over the hour, so I think we can um, take questions if there's time for questions, Eric. Uh, y yes, we we do have a couple of questions. We do a few, I suppose, but I think you guys did a pretty good job of uh, covering most of the bases. Here is a good question, uh, and I'm going to throw a little side joke into the mix here. One of the attendees writes that there is a, a debate around the utilization of the operational data store. Uh, obviously, a lot of times it's used for BI only, but sometimes it certainly could be used for other purposes, even transactional. And my joke is that uh, someone I know who does not like the ODS says it's odious. I think that's pretty funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, Robin and then Mark, do you want to comment on the use of an operational data store? Well, I mean, the only thing that I've got to say is that where I've seen them used, they were used simply because data warehouse was too slow. So that's how it started. You know, you would pull stuff straight out of um, uh, operational systems, uh, systems into a store and feed it into BI applications. But, you know, once you've created a data store, you've created a data store, and um, what happens after that is the evolution of that. Um, and certainly, you know, I've seen... Cycles where data is fed into a data warehouse and then various calculations are feeding stuff back into operational systems. So, you know, the fact that it's come into a BI area doesn't mean that everything will stay in a kind of query mode. Uh, anything can happen, really. Mark? Yeah, and, uh, you know, it also, there's this, this problem of the, just like everything else, what the heck an operational data store means, you know, the, the original sort of long ago definition of all of your operational data in one place being updated right there versus something where it's a replication of transactional systems live, which is then used as a source versus more like a staging area containing partial replicas over maybe not real time used for reporting purposes that aren't being handled because of time latency issues with a, a data warehouse. And so the, the architectural definition, um, I think, really <laughs> comes into play there. 
Yeah, we got another interesting comment here about um, document stores and approaches. One of the attendees writes, document store approaches with embedded XML tags seems to be more flexible for storing, accessing, and indexing nested documents than the object relational impedance matching approach. Um, that makes sense to me, but do you guys want to comment on that? Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, <laughs> it, that sort of object document store, um, which I, I think throwing XML into it, uh, I don't think that that's necessarily a requirement, but having a store that can label and access all of the elements and kind of help you define somewhat of a schema over those things, and then enable you to use information retrieval techniques as opposed to relational query techniques um, makes a big difference, but there's a trade-off. You know, there's always trade-offs with these technologies, and one of the things that you trade off there is the, that you have, let's say it's sort of an expressed hierarchical data model. Now try and query that thing, and as long as you walk the hierarchical paths, it's great. That was the old hierarchical databases, by the way. And then we throw in these indexing techniques and, and IR techniques of, of sort of um, search and retrieval, and we have the ability to pull things out and join those indexes. And we can do some level of um, joining and so forth, but the problem is if you didn't build an index on a particular um, attribute or node in the hierarchy or you know, however you, you've implemented this particular uh, object store, you will not be able to join that to something else without doing a full-on processing through the entire document collection. You know, it's the difference between an index and a full table scan or a relational database. And the, the limitation of many of the, the um, data stores like that is that if there is not what is essentially a join index between different things, then you can't query it efficiently without going over the whole collection. And so it becomes an art form of understanding your queries, which gets back to the predictability or unpredictability thereof. And of course, different products like, say, MarkLogic or Endeka or Sand are going to give you different ways to tune that, different ways to join it, and different ways to express the results. And so you almost have to take your expected workload and try each one to understand how it's going to behave because there's no real solid rules of, of thumb or guidelines for, for those things. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, good. We have a really interesting uh, observation here from one of the attendees. I just thought it was uh, kind of a fascinating look. Uh, I can't see it in front of me, but I remember what she wrote. And she basically said it used to be that choosing a database was a very serious strategic decision that was mapped out in a sort of 10-year span because you're planning for the future and you know certainly for transactional processing. It's not the kind of thing you want to be changing um, anytime soon. You want to make a decision and stick with it. But it, it seems now that the the cycle time for reviewing database technology and implementing it has really shortened significantly. Um, I guess that's kind of an obvious statement, but do you guys want to comment maybe first, Robin, and then Mark, about how the process of choosing a database really has changed in light of all these new options? Well, <laughs> well, yes. Um, but you see, in my experience, and I've kind of been involved in database selection for actually I don't know, two decades, you know, in my experience, people didn't do it particularly well in the first instance in the sense that a lot of people I came across really have a process for selecting a database product. So whether it's actually worse than it used to be, um, I don't know. I think that there is... And I think that one of the things that is, uh, in a way, distorted it is nowadays technical people can just download um, an awful lot of open source stuff and start messing with it, you know? Uh, and that will often preempt a database selection process. And if that was kind of taken into account, you know, there's no reason to stop technical people doing technical things. But if, if their activity was taken into the database um, uh, selection rather than 
being a kind of, uh, I don't know, a backdoor method that almost mandates what technology is going to be used, and that would that would make sense. So I think that's um, a, a phenomenon right now. I mean, it used to be that databases were very, very expensive, and they still are in, in most instances for the kind of products that we've been talking about. Um, if you do database selection completely quickly and without fault, you'll regret it. You, you know, you might get it right by accident, but you won't get it right because you knew what you were doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and here's a very specific question I'll throw over to Mark, perhaps. Uh, one of the attendees asks, are there adapters to connect C language routines to the map and or reduce side of the Hadoop distributed processing framework? In other words, where the key that is used to distribute the data payload can be a process ID of a set of C language services? Unfortunately, my uh, hands-on with Hadoop is limited to running test cases using things like JavaScript and Python. So I don't know about C language bindings. Okay, no worries. Uh, we got just a couple other uh, comments here. And folks, thank you so much for all these great questions. I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to send in your comments. Okay, here's uh, maybe a last question here and we'll wrap up. So one of the attendees writes, the scalability, availability, cost, complexity issues do not apply. Oh, actually, <laughs> this is, I remember the, which one this is. Someone's talking about uh, HP nonstop SQL. Do either of you know much about H HP nonstop SQL? Well, I used to know uh, much he, about it. <laughs> In the past when HP was doing um, uh, a lot of work to actually try and establish it. <laughs> Well, yeah, well, Tandem in the, yeah, sorry, when it joined Compaq first and then later joined, Compaq joined HP, it, it seemed to um, die as a product that was actually looking looking for new customers. Uh, and what was the, there was a BI product that HP based, um, uh, was based on non-stop SQL. Can you remember what that was, Mark? But there it was is, NeoView? Yeah, 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 I think yeah, it was yeah. Hey, okay, here's actually one really good question for closing out. Um, and if you will both each just comment on this, uh, I think it's a good sort of general question. One of the attendees writes, if SQL is as weak as Mark and Robin suggest, how are we so mesmerized with it for decades? <laughs> um, well, I, I don't actually think SQL is weak. In fact, I think SQL is great. It's just got a few limitations, like the... Uh, uh, in the relational model, the assumption that there is no order to data and the difficulty of handling hierarchical structures. I mean, you, you normalize them into tables, and then when you query them out, the problem is that a result set, um, a single SQL result set doesn't map back to what a program uses. It doesn't map to the fact that there's a hierarchy in data. So these forms of data, the structural form of data, whether it be ordering or hierarchy or, or kind of a network linkage, which is just another way of saying ordering. Um, the, the, those things are some of the challenges. And uh, um, the other is when you're dealing with a lot of simple applications, the number of layers that you go through that introduces uh, latency into the equation you know, we build systems now, websites and things like that, which have true real-time characteristics. And so you need to be able to get and put your data in tens to hundreds of milliseconds. And um, when you have that requirement at an extremely large scale, uh, you start to run into some challenges. And one of the things that you can do is strip that stuff off. But what you trade out is joins, join complexity, and all of these other things which will come back to bite you later if you're not really careful if you try to jettison SQL. So it's one of these uh, horses for courses kind of things and, and you know, is it muddy or isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Robin, do you want to, you want to kind of comment on And I guess I'd throw well, out. I kind of, I kind of agree with, with Mark on this thing. It, 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 it's like the, you know, Relational, relational database was dominant because most of the things people wanted to do could be done with relational database. 
the reason it lasted so long is it it, it turns out to be a 90% solution, you know. But it was never a 100% solution, and there are all sorts of systems that I've run into. I mean, you know, extremely fast transaction processing systems couldn't use relational databases. were often hand-coded by the telcos. You know, you, you, there are loads and loads of examples of where, well, it just didn't actually fit. However, it, it fit most things, and because it fit most things, um, it became dominant and... You know, by you know, there were performance problems in the early 90s. By about 1996, 97, there wasn't any OLTP complaints that I heard. Mm -hmm. And one closing remark I'd make is just that all these new database technologies are definitely worth a look just to understand them so you can wrap your head around possible use cases because one of the key characteristics, it seems to me, with a lot of these new technologies is that they have been designed to circumvent some of the traditional constraints. And, you know, let's face it, some of this open source stuff is still fairly nascent. I've heard uh, a couple horror stories about people using some of these technologies and then something happens um, with the, uh, the actual product itself, changes occur, and that causes some trouble. So these are new technologies, but keep your eye on them, folks, because Certainly, there are applications, and uh, you can do some amazing things with this stuff, and the price just isn't what it used to be. So watch for some of these price points to start coming down across the board. Well, folks, thank you so much for sticking with us for 82 minutes. That's a pretty long webcast. We will archive this webcast at databaserevolutions.com. We're going to keep the research going. I should point that out. There is going to be a part two of all this coming later this year. We're going to have database as the topic of the month in the briefing room for October. So definitely check us out then. But we're going to be doing a lot more research into database, and you can find it all at databaserevolutions.com. So that does conclude our webcast, folks. Thank you so much for your time and attention. We hope to catch up with you next time. Take care. Bye-bye.